Okay. Good evening. Thank you very much for being here, especially on a dark and stormy night. Um, I'm particularly honored to be speaking here. I have watched the Tenement Museum grow over years, and uh, I do believe it's one of the most uh, remarkable cultural institutions, certainly in the city, and I would say in the world, uh, precisely because of what it celebrates and what it helps us not forget about our own past and our own history. Yeah, the microphone's resonating. Can we, can we play with that a little bit? Toward, toward my voice. Is that better? Not so much. A little bit up more. Uh, I could hold it, but uh, is this? Let, let me keep talking. If it's still, it's still doing that. Is it? Let me. I could do. What if I back up just a little bit, Craig? Okay. All right. Ah, oh, the brave new world of technology. <laughs> so, this evening, what I want to discuss is, uh, I want to pose a question to you, and I want to ask why garbage, blunt subject, almost a crude word. One of my bosses once told me, you shouldn't say you do research on garbage. And I said, well, wh what should I say then? And she said, oh, I don't know, but something else, not garbage. But in fact, the people whose lives I've come to know a little bit and uh, about whom I write in the book, that's what they have to deal with every day. And so my curiosity is about the substance of it and the very complex infrastructure that it requires of especially a city this size, and we'll get into that a little bit. But what I want to ask, and sort of have us mull over this evening, why do we not consider history from the perspective of what we throw out? We create an archaeological, a pretty sophisticated and, and uh, very deep archaeological record by the act of discarding, and yet we don't look at historical trajectories of anywhere in particular from the perspective of how solid waste is managed. There are a couple of exceptions to that, but they are just that, exceptions. So how is garbage coded? What does it symbolize? Why do we ignore it when it's such an ever-present part of our lives? And the people associated with it, how are they coded? How do we, what symbol do they carry for us because their work involves trash? Tonight I'm going to talk specifically about the history of this neighborhood and its relationship to garbage and waste over from the late uh, 19th, well, mid 19th century through the early 20th century. Um, this was ground zero for the Department of Street Cleaning when street cleanliness was finally made effective, as I'll show you. Uh, I'm also going to talk about um, how moral hygiene is coded in the way we understand neighborhoods and the people who live in them. So let's start with some maps. I love maps. This is an image of the original shoreline of lower, lower, lower Manhattan, not, not as far north as we are, when the Dutch arrived in 1609. And the, the web on top of it is the contemporary street grid. Um, these pins are at the five locations where Peter Stuyvesant told the Dutch settlers they were legally allowed to throw out their trash. You notice that it's all on the river's edge, right? On Pearl Street for the most part. This particular pin is at Pearl Street and Coente's Slip. So keep, keep in mind what that looks like here. That's the exact same location today, Pearl Street and Coente's Slip. That land, that web that, that the street grid shows on top of what was here originally, much of that is built on garbage. Not all of it, but a whole lot of it. So that anytime there's a construction project downtown, archaeologists are mandated to come in and make sure we're not destroying treasures from the colonial era or earlier than that. I just want you to keep that in mind. We're going to get back to that at, at, the, at the end. This is a more contemporary, this is, this is uh, from 1870, I'm sorry, 1865. This is a map of the ward districts of New York City. It's how we used to organize ourselves politically into different wards. You are right now in Ward 10, what was Ward 10. I don't know if you can see the X on the map. That's where we are exactly right now, in the middle of Ward 10. This is another perspective on the same, the same geography. This part of the city was famous for many reasons. It was very crowded. It was one of the most diverse corners of New York, well, really of the world. As you heard in the video, it was not just crowded. It was the most crowded, some of the blocks, the most crowded in the world. Uh, in the 19th, uh, late 19th century. It was also uh, among the most um, 
uh, garbage strewn and filthiest streets. And this was because of entrenched corruption on the part of local politicians, which became fodder for all kinds of very creative communication mechanisms aimed at people who don't read, right? Um, either you have a population of various literacies or you have people who just, they, they don't read or write. So how do you communicate with them? Through political cartoons, through illustrations, this is the system by which garbage was managed. It's a little hard to follow the whole thing through. This is from 1877, where it's collected and it's taken out by barge and then dumped in some idyllic location that would no doubt be vastly improved by having garbage dumped all over it. Um, <laughs> We uh, sometimes decided not to go to wherever the dumping point was and just get rid of it in the harbor. This caused some very interesting problems over time. We actually filled our own shipping channels something like eight different times in one year in the 1880s. Uh, it was illegal already by then, but it was easier, especially on a stormy day or if you just want to get home quicker, to uh, just dump it in the harbor. This particular illustration, I think, is quite prescient. The idea is to use garbage as a source of energy, fuel, heat, which we do. If you live in Manhattan, chances are good that your household waste goes to a waste to energy facility in Essex, New Jersey, or another one slightly down, a little bit farther down the highway, um, that is then burned and turned into energy that is sold to the surrounding communities. So this is, a, this is meant as mockery, but it's actually uh, a pretty accurate prediction. The most vulnerable to the sorry state of the streets were the most poor. And this is where you see these cartoons. King Garbage was a prevalent political figure in New York who was con cavorting with the powers, the very fat powers that be, to the detriment of the most vulnerable of New, York's, of New York citizens. Death was also um, a uh, common visitor because of the state of the streets. At one point in the 1800s, the death rate for New York City, the mortality rate, exceeded that of medieval London. And people were dying from diseases that even then we knew how to prevent. This is a four-part series that uh, mocks uh, the local politicians by uh, trying to come up with various creative ways to deal with the problem of trash in the streets. I like that Hercules says basically, what are you, nuts? I c I'm not doing it. Um, this, this illustration, you see how anything to do with garbage is coded here as something savage, something, something uncivilized, which in fact is one of the ways in which garbage is a, a, a very dense symbolic force, even today. When we see garbage strewn about a street, one of the things that we read from that is, this place is not well tended, there's something tending toward chaos here, there's something out of order here. Um, the Lower East Side was that um, pretty much, pretty much uh, all the time. This illustration, you, it's hard to read the caption, but, but it's Irish street sweepers. Um, this is from Harper's Weekly in 1890, and one part of it, said, these are, it's called the neophyte, and the two senior sweepers are counseling the newcomer. Never sweep up today what you can leave for tomorrow. And it, of course, it's written in this lovely brogue that I won't try to imitate. Um, so the Lower East Side, it, it was infamous for many reasons, including being, um, the most crowded, the dirtiest, and the deadliest in the world because of those diseases. Upper class New Yorkers who could afford private, what would we would call private carters, private sweepers, who would have clean neighborhoods in wealthy corners, they would come to places like the Lower East Side to, as tourists. And the ladies are holding violet scented handkerchiefs to their noses while they look upon a scavenger who's actually earning a living that way. I'll get to that in a minute. So this is actually, this is what it looked like. These are photographs published in Harper's Weekly in 1895, uh, sorry, 1893. And they are all from around here or close to here. This is what the city looked like. To, no, one ever, no one had lived long enough to remember the city looking different from this. This particular illustration of the push carts, that was a whole separate related problem that was solved. I'll, I'll get to that in just a minute, but don't forget the push cart picture. So this is, this is the city. This is what we live in. This is our life. This is it every day. Um, this, one of the problems, one of the many problems, the idea of sweeping and leaving it or not sweeping it because it'll be there tomorrow. The debris was swept and the carts came an hour later, a day later, a week later. Not a very effective way to make sure that whatever you've swept stays up. So then, 1895, this guy shows up. George Waring is a Civil War veteran. He's a colonel. 
He is a self-styled sanitary engineer and an entrepreneur and somebody who's very good at what we would today call PR. Um, he takes a workforce that looks like this and he makes it look like this. He puts the men in white uniforms. These are the sweepers, not the carters. Um, and there's a few reasons for the white. Again, thinking about symbol symbols and the weight of how things look and how we read um, things like the helmet, that was the same as what the police of the day wore, and the uniforms are white like what medical authorities wore. So he wanted the public to understand clean streets are a, a key issue of public health and public hygiene. Um, he also, oh wait, there's one more reason to put him in white. Anybody have a guess? If they get dirty, they have to clean. It, oh. they if they get dirty, they have to be changed. And there's a research project not yet done that I welcome anyone to pick up because it would be fascinating. Who washed those, right? Um, so that that's that's part of it, but I, there's another reason, and I heard it. You can, not just if they've been working, and, not, and safety wasn't yet a concern the way it is today. Um, it, it's more about surveillance. If you're wearing bright white when you're on the street doing your work, it's a lot harder to sneak off to the pub for a pint, right? <laughs> so that was, the, the workers were not fond of these uniforms, as you might imagine. Uh, the carters got to wear brown. I, I'm not sure why the, I mean, car, they're both doing messy work, but the carters got to wear brown. Waring made sure that the engines of the department, the horses, were of the right breed and strength and that the people charged with their care were qualified for that work. This is basically um, when you're headed out for the day and you're going to, um, today you would get in your truck, you've got your route, you get in your truck, you go on the street. This is hitching your cart to your horse and then you get your orders and out you go. The uh, carts were, he made sure that they were no longer wooden, which leaked and stank. They were uh, uh, metal, which are much easier to maintain and clean. He, he also professionalized the workforce so that there was very hardwired accountability. As a military man, he imposed what uh, was essentially a military organizational structure on the workforce. He gave them sections and districts, and you were accountable up the chain of command all the way to him about how your work was done or not done. And if it was not done, you better have a good reason. He also uh, instituted uh, curbside recycling. What, well, we didn't call it back then curbside recycling. but So people whose work was to scavenge and to create these kinds of collections, or maybe these guys, these kinds of, this kind of, um, they were doing textiles. Um, he instituted curbside source separated recycling. Um, that was his idea was that we would sell to intermediate markets enough of the stuff we would collect this way that we would make the Department of Street Cleaning independent. There's a problem with that. First of all, it didn't work. But secondly, there was an informal economy in scavenging and gleaning on which all kinds of families depended. And if he formalized that work, they, it, it really literally meant the difference between life and death. And he was sensitive to that. So if you look at this picture in the very far right, at the end of the line, there's a woman. And there's, in fact, a, a story in the New York Times about one of the women that he put on the line who was absolutely expert in sorting and in understanding the origins of all the material that came to the city because it had been her livelihood as an informal street scavenger for, for decades. So this is what happened. He did this. These are the before and afters. March of 1893 uh, is the first set of pictures, and June of 1895 is the second set of pictures. He's only been in office now six months, and this is what he did. And he started in five points. He very deliberately started in five points. He said to his workforce, if I can't clean five points, I can't clean New York. Five points at the time was probably the dirtiest, grimiest, dir most dangerous, most difficult neighborhood in the city. Um, and it took two weeks before the residents stopped throwing bricks and stones at them because who wants the government of any entity wandering through those avenues and back ways and whatnot. Um, but then they began to understand that the department was there to help them and they became their best allies and strongest advocates. So what do you do when your workforce has gone from being a bunch of malcreant, malcontent, corrupt, lazy, no good, meh, into something that has transformed the city almost overnight. 
into something sparkling where you can see curb lines and cobblestones and you can walk across the street without ruining your shoes or, or fearing for your health and when you open the windows in the summer. So how do you celebrate that? We well, throw a parade, of course. <laughs> the, uh, in 18, what was the first one? 1880, I've gotten ahead of myself here. The very first Labor Day parade ever was 1882 from City Hall up to Union Square. And it started a tradition of laborers of specific categories had their own parades. You had tailors and cobblers and bricklayers and now street cleaners. And at first the press was like, oh, come on. This is a ridiculous idea because these guys are, as I said, lazy, no good, blah, blah, blah. Except then they looked around at the street and they realized, no, they had actually transformed the city. And they became heroes. The route of the parade, and by the way, if you're ever talking to somebody on sanitation, they don't work a route, they work a route, just so you know. Uh, my book has a 10-page glossary in the back of sanitation slang. What is that? What did the route say? I have no idea. <laughs> the question was why. I, I don't know. Um, they couldn't speak in, yeah, maybe they couldn't speak in a root route. Anyway, the, I want to just mention in this picture, one of Waring's innovations was what he called the juvenile leagues. He got children to, he gave them hats and badges and little books so that they could go out and write the equivalent of summonses. No enforcement power, but if someone littered, someone, a kid would be up in their face very quickly like, no, you shouldn't do that. Um, it'd be hard to imagine that kind of uh, initiative today. So it, the route went from uh, Central Park down Fifth Avenue to past the reservoir. Where did we ha have the reservoir picture? Um, I didn't get there yet. The reservoir at 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue, which was uh, replaced with the library in 1898. Uh, and there were awards given for the best groomed horses and the district that had the tightest marching formation. It was sort of a competitive thing. And over time, these guys became, the uniform changed a little bit, but for decades, they were in white. And the white wings, as they were nicknamed, became part of a kind of a popular culture, kind of iconic figures. There were Broadway shows written about them, and novels, and songs, and they even made appearances in movies. This one, I forget the name of this one, it's in 1932. Charlie Chaplin in the film City Lights does a turn as a street sweeper, as a, as a white wing. Um, and it looked to me like they got the locker room from that era pretty accurate. So, and then the job continues. So you have uh, one, of the, one of the many skills you have to master if you're going to do the job successfully is how do you keep a team of horses uh, working together and going where they're supposed to go. The Teamsters Union, the symbol is two horse heads back to back. Their foundation was the teams, to be a teamster was to have the skill to master a team of horses, which is a, a hard-won skill. It's, it's one of the many ways in which, uh, let's say, solid waste management or garbage work is not an unskilled labor, right? So the, um, the horses would pull the carts, the carts would head to the dumping piers, and the men would muscle the carts uh, up so that they would empty, no hydraulics then, right, no cranes, and then they would head back out for another load. This is from East 17th Street and the East River, uh, same one here. These, uh, this is a rather newfangled one, oh no, this is, this is where once the garbage was being dumped, there was a whole other team of people. They were not employed by the city, they were employed by a private contractor to tr do what's called trim the scow. That means you're going to make sure the load is balanced so that when a tugboat pulls it out to sea, it's, the, it's traveling safely. But they also were given permission to keep whatever they found that they might want to uh, hold on to. Um, and then they would um, put it aside. I'll get to that in just a minute. This is, this is also over on the East River in the teens, a very fancy dumping board where you take the cart up in an elevator and then tip it over the side so it's... I'm not, I'm not sure the, the justification for that structure, but um, I'm intrigued by the architectural um, creativity of it. So this is, a, this is a, a scow loaded, ready to go out, not netted, by the way. Sometimes they didn't actually go out um, if there were problems. In fact, there are some interesting examples of corruption where people, there was one barge moored in the East River that didn't have a bottom. <laughs> that, was a, that was a good way to make land among other things. Um, and so here are the guys working. You, it's a little hard to see in this particular image, but you, there are people on that pile. 
And, and not only are there people on the pile, but underneath the pier are their wives and mothers and children helping to sort the material that they were pulling off the boats. So this is not just the men. These are families. And these, this is where they're living. Um, and this is uh, the reality of their lives. I'm just going to, this is, uh, as you saw, Thomas Edison in 1903 filmed this. He did, by the way, a lovely set of, of very mundane, quite beautiful film clips of New York City in 1903 um, that I encourage you to look up on YouTube. It will, um, it's fun to watch them and try and figure out what structures are still in place and what pieces of the skyline you can recognize from back then and now. So these guys in, this, in doing this work, they're, they're Italians. In this era, they're Italians. And there was some uh, concern that Italians, anyone doing this work, would be uh, harmed or would get sick because this is a very difficult labor, right? Um, and there were a couple of city hall, uh, city council hearings. And um, so one of the conclusions was the ashes, garbage, and refuse that's almost literally deposited on the backs and heads of these people who stand there as fast as each cartload is dumped and spread these valuable materials. These people also live, eat, sleep, and have their sole habitation under the dumps of the street cleaning department. It has never yet been charged that these people who are employed in this business have become sick, that they have spread contagion, or that they have bred an epidemic, but on the contrary, that they seem to thrive in their habitations and upon the places in which they live. And even our friend George Waring said that the Italians are a race with a genius for rag and bone picking and for subsisting on rejected trifles of food. So I mentioned earlier the, the sort of coding of garbage and the moral hygiene that we associate with different forms of labor. Um, this, was a blunt, this was a blunt racism of that era. So that's the kind of tugboat that would have pulled the scows out to sea. Um, that's kind of what it would have looked like on the voyage. And then it's offloaded with pitchforks and shovels and rakes. It doesn't look very safe. It wasn't very safe. There's a chapter in the book called, um, gosh, what's it called? Something about an angry sea. And it's the story of six boats that go out, two tugboats and four scows, and then only one boat comes back. And what happened to all those people? Um, if you glance at, if you look at the uh, historic, like the archival New York Times back from this era, if you look at the headlines, you'll see, scowmen drowned, scow trimmer killed at sea, scowmen lost, dead. It, it happened a, a lot. And those people are, um, it's hard to find records of that. So the job continues. Um, the technology, we don't, as we were fully mechanized as of 1934, um, a little late maybe, but we, we finally got it all on trucks instead of carts with horses. The, the trucks got very tall, which seemed to me pretty counterintuitive. Uh, it was a three-man crew then, and you kind of see why. One tosses it up, one empties it, and then the other goes to fetch the next one. These guys look like they're just having a good time, right? <laughs> Finally, in the um, late 30s, the trucks get a little shorter. And then we have this lovely, I think it would make a great postcard of New York City, sort of 1930s, early 40s machinery of street cleaning. The architecture of the job had a grandeur to it. And I will tell you that that's still the case more often than you might know. The um, Spring Street combined garage at the West Side Highway is 95% finished. It will probably win architectural awards. It, it is built to lead gold standards, which means that they do things like all the water for the power washing of the trucks is from uh, rainwater and gray water. Um, so this is from, from the 1920s. This is on, uh, I forget which street, but it's the teens way over on the east side, um, Avenue C, East 17th Street and Avenue C. They are, they are handsome structures. These are the carts out front having been washed and they're tipped up to dry. This is uh, from 1921. The photographer, he's a famous city photographer, and I'm going to mispronounce his name. He was French. Eugène Salignac. Yes? Anyone? He's the one. You know the picture of the Brooklyn Bridge with the guys sitting in the stays of the bridge? He took that picture. And he took these two pictures. So that's 1921. This is September of 1922. It came down, um, which I think is sad. Some of what we built going forward, this is over on the Gensevoort Peninsula on the uh, Hudson River at 12th Street. It was uh, built as an incinerator and what's called an MTS, a marine transfer station. The garbage goes, um, uh, some of it is burned uh, in the incinerator and then some of it is dumped into, uh, again, barges and scows. 
uh, in the structure that's over the river. That, uh, they're still there. The smokestacks came down in 84. I believe it was decommissioned in 82. Uh, these are pictures of the same location from the water because if you think about how the city survives and how we rely on an army of people to do a work that we mostly don't want to have to think about. And because it's mostly done well, we don't have to think about it. It's one of the privileges of living here. Um, why don't they have a museum? This location, this is a, the Egbert Veeley map, an excerpt from it. You see the sharp jag into the water. That all was fill. Um, and then they pulled some of it out uh, to put piers in place. This is the same location. The only thing left of that fill is the box on the left here. That's the location I was just um, talking about. It's, it's in a political, I was telling Laura, it's in a political, it's a political hot potato for a lot of reasons. I don't want the whole eight acres. I just want the building. Just, just this. Look, just this. Just that, right? It, the part that their building could flow right through it. You could have green roof on the, on the green space on the roof that could be ball fields. You could have uh, community gathering space and lecture space and rotating exhibit. Oh, big dreams, big dreams. So I showed you in the beginning the map of lower Manhattan and the, what we've built out from the shoreline. This is a slightly bigger context. It's the shoreline of the larger metropolitan region and all of it that's been built on fill. Um, ever more. This map is actually about 20 years out of date, and I, I think there's probably, we could fill in more black, black areas there. So um, the, the parade I told you about, that's it, right? Um, and I want to I wanna conclude with a, a quote from Jacob Rees. You all know who he was? Uh, a photographer and journalist and reformer, and a very keen observer of New York City in the start of the 20th century. Um, and let me just add, Colonel Waring, he was only in office for three years. The reform mayor who had been voted in in 1895 was voted out the next term. He didn't like the Tammany people who had come back, so he left. He went to Havana uh, basically as a, as a solid waste consultant, they will, and, a, and a, he also had designed sewer systems, and they wanted to figure out a way to build a better sewer system in Havana. He was still in that era a, um, a miasmist. That means that he did not believe in the germ theory of disease transmission. He felt that we get sick from bad smells and bad airs. While he was in Havana, he was bitten by a mosquito that was carrying yellow fever. He returned to New York and died in October of 1898. Um, he was only 63, I think. So in 1902, Jacob Rees wrote, it was Colonel Waring's broom that first let light into the slum. He accomplished that which we had come to be, which had come to be considered an impossible task. The streets that had been dirty were swept. The ash barrels which had befouled the sidewalks disappeared. The trucks, and that's more than 60,000 horse-drawn trucks like the ones that I showed you that was packed with crud. Uh, the trucks that obstructed the children's only playground, the street, went with the dirt. His broom saved more lives in the crowded tenements than a squad of doctors. It did more. It swept the cobwebs out of our civic brain and conscience. And then here's the part I like best because it's a little cryptic. And set up a standard of a citizen's duty, which will be ours until we have dragged other things than our pavements out of the mud. This goes on for a little while. <laughs> I could talk at you for longer, but um, it's time, I think, for Q&A. Yeah. OK. All right, so uh, this talk is being broadcast via live stream. And we want to make sure that your question gets picked up by our, our um, our sound system. So we have a microphone up here. If anyone has a question to ask Robin, I ask that you come to Kat and she'll be happy to hand you the microphone. That also means I won't have to repeat your question so everyone can hear it, which is a good thing. Oh, before we start Q&A, I forgot to say proper thank you to you, Laura, and to Annie Poland, and to Craig, who's doing the tech, 
and to my five students who are here tonight because we usually meet on Wednesday, so I said they had to come here instead. <laughs> <coughs> and they're all here. And to the parents of one of my students from last semester. They're here from Seattle. And um, I was delighted when they walked in and introduced themselves. So Mr. and Mrs. Jackshaw, thank you for being here. But mostly, especially all of you, on a, as I had said, a dark and stormy night. Um, I'm very grateful that you're here. OK, now we can talk. OK, so if you have a question, you can come on up. Hi, I'm Susie. Thank you for your talk. It was really informative. Um, I'm not sure. I'm sure this is in the range of your expertise, but I'm curious to the extent, the extent that you can speak to it. Um, my curiosity is kind of surrounding informal trash collection and the role that informal trash collection still plays in much of the world. Um, so I'm wondering, like, kind of what the pros and cons are to formalizing systems and ways that it can actually be limiting or destructive to people's lives who sustain themselves by means of trash collection. So I was hoping you could speak to that. Um, I, th I can a little. Uh, Susie, thank you for your question. Um, uh, informal waste collection systems, and I shouldn't maybe even use the word system, but there are probably millions of people around the world who depend, who, whose survival depends on that. Um, I can refer you to a few documentaries that will uh, fo that focus on specific corners of the world. Thank you. Um, Garbage Dreams is about uh, Egyptians. Uh, in fact, I think one of them was profiled in the New Yorker uh, a week or so ago. And then uh, Wasteland is a film by Lucy Walker about scavengers in Brazil. Um, I have colleagues who've worked in Buenos Aires and uh, in a few other cities who have tracked the disruption of formalized recycling systems. When those are put in place by city government, uh, it doesn't necessarily do a better job of getting material out of the waste stream. It does bring revenue and employment, um, formal employment, but at the same time it uh, dislodges, in some cases, generations. Uh, families who've been doing gleaning work for generations. That's another great film called The Gleaners and I by the French filmmaker Agnès Varda. Agnès Varda. Um, so it's, I, I can't say it's, a, it's a, uh, always a universal harm nor always a universal good. If formal systems are put in place to replace informal scavenging economies. Are the people who had relied on those economies folded into the new system the way George Waring did with the curbside program he put in place? That's, that would be the key question. And in Wasteland, what you learn through that film is that the recyclers have formed a cooperative so that as they are displaced by formal systems, they will have a voice. And they can, in fact, help shape that system. There's a lot to this, though, of course. There's a, there's a book by, uh, the author's name is Medina, called World Scavengers. Uh, it's got a, a good bibliography if you want to mine that for more. Here, you know what, let me just oh, thank you. I think I have a, a relevant follow-up question to that, which it occurs to me because of world scavenging occupational issues. Um, it was a lot of, were a lot of children part of the family money-making situation, scavenging the stuff, and did they use them in much smaller quarters or areas where their smallness would help them get to the bottom of stuff or things like that? Uh, the answer to the first part of your question is yes, children were key, and um, not just to <coughs> bringing in money for the family, but also for their own, that's how they ate. They would find food, they would um, find a, 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 a bit of bone or a button or, or a bit of wire and trade it for a penny, uh, and then they could have lunch um, or dinner or breakfast. In terms of the sort of the, um, the way in which a smaller body can get at things that an adult can't, I don't know. I'm going to guess that, yes, that was a factor. Um, 
what children could do that adults couldn't do as easily was run in and out very quickly and squeeze through holes and gaps that an adult couldn't get through. So um, they were, I, I mentioned it a little bit in the book, they were, um, they were not loved. They, it was not understood that these were vulnerable uh, children who maybe should have someone figuring out how to make sure they didn't have to scavenge to survive and maybe maybe they should be in school or maybe they should learn a trade or maybe in other words some kind of uh, formal um, intervention uh, they were called they all kinds of different names for these kids a ragamuffin was the most was the least offensive but there was a whole list of others I, I, I forget them off the top of my head but um, because they could move in and out so quickly, especially people of privilege saw them as a uh, sort of a threat, like a predatory threat, because they could pick pockets, they could grab jewelry, they could, and then they'd be gone. Um, so they they were thought to be a, a scourge on the uh, on the life of the city in these parts, in these in these neighborhoods. By the way, does everyone know what sanitation district this is? You do? Did you not? Oh, do you know? Not anymore. What did it used to be? We, we do have some retired sanitation people in the house. It's at, well, you know, Nick. <laughs> you better know. Nick is one of my students, so yeah, he better know. Yes, it's the Manhattan 3 district. And it, um, yeah, two now is on the west side, 3 is on the east side. And it's still famously challenging to keep this particular corner of the city clean. Uh, and there have been all kinds of initiatives that the city has introduced over the years um, to solve the problem, but it's not, as you know, it, it isn't something that you solve on a Saturday and then it's done. You solve it on a Saturday and you have to start over on a Monday. More questions, comments? Um, we'll go gentleman up front and then... I'm stuck. Oh, um, would you mind standing Well, I'm bad look about it. Okay. Hi. I think you're a show-off. Uh, hi, I have a two-part question. My first part of the, part of the question is, uh, are you familiar at all with the uh, sanitation conditions in Africa? And B, do you think there might be a connection between this outbreak of Ebola and the sanitary conditions that are existing in Africa? Um, y no and yes. I, I don't know much about conditions in Africa, although I have colleagues at NYU, that's what they research is sanitary conditions in Africa. But because diseases that rely on, d diseases that can spread through things like a, a Kleenex or a piece of clothing, when you have no system to m keep solid waste moving and to move it away from the people who create it, it it raises the risk of spreading disease of many different kinds. And, and I don't, I'm not a physician, I'm, not a, I'm no expert on Ebola at all, but anytime you have conditions where garbage isn't collected and it piles up, you're going to have a health problem. And, oh, yes. That there could be a connection between the Ebola outbreak. Oh, between the a particular outbreak right now? I, right. I don't know. But it's spread. The, the, I, it, it is probably going to, any disease is going to spread faster in a place where garbage is not well managed. What were some of the disease, diseases of the day here in New York when the sanitation conditions were not so good? Some of the diseases here in New York when, of the day back then were uh, cholera, smallpox, yellow fever, typhus, diphtheria, measles killed people, mumps killed people. Um, uh, lots of things that we didn't have a, a firm diagnosis for back then, but that um, were deadly, especially if left untreated. Yellow fever was particularly violent because um, they said things like you'd be, um, a woman would be sitting at her dressing table in the morning and in her coffin in the evening because it went so fast. Cholera also, the spread of cholera, cholera was finally understood as a waterborne disease thanks to a really stubborn doctor in London named John Snow who mapped the cholera outbreaks from a particular pump in a neighborhood in London and proved that everyone who got sick had somehow been drinking water from that pump. This was, remember this is still before the germ theory has any, it doesn't exist yet, and so people think you get, people think you get illnesses because you stood too close to someone of, of poor moral character 
right? And the way that disease spread, people, especially in this neighborhood, uh, people who live in very difficult, dirty conditions, they must live in those conditions because they themselves are of questionable character and their own moral hygiene, the phrase I used at the, at the beginning of the evening, is not um, proper. And so illness then is understood as a punishment. And I would like to say that that attitude has uh, faded, but of course, if you think back to the start of the AIDS epidemic, it was understood to be a punishment for all kinds of uh, alleged sins. And Ebola in Africa is being treated, people, some communities are ostracizing those who get sick because it, it, they, you can code the victim of the disease as somehow deserving the punishment, right? This is not, it's not a new analysis and it's not, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty unfortunate one. Uh, this was also the uh, period when uh, civil service reform was beginning, and I was just wondering, were these white wings, uh, were these civil service positions uh, filled by exams? If they no. weren't, uh, when, when did that come into uh, sanitation workers? I believe the civil service reforms came into sanitation in the uh, very early part of the 20th century. Um, I don't know how the jobs were, f I don't know how Waring, Colonel Waring, hired people. I do know that when he took office, there were a few conditions he put on the mayor. He said, don't mess with me. Like he wouldn't, he wouldn't agree to be commissioner until the mayor said to him, I promise I won't mess with you. And because part of the problem before had been, if I'm the mayor and my friend wants a job and you're commissioner of street cleaning, well, you're going to give him a job, even though he never shows up and he doesn't do his work. Guaranteed way to spend a lot of money not cleaning the streets. So as a really dedicated reformer, that was condition one. And then condition two was to all the entire workforce, if you do your job, you keep your job. And he, he later told, he gave a talk in which he said, I love this, five-eighths of the workforce stayed. Very precise fraction. Um, he also stepped outside of whatever were the standard hiring procedures back then. And, and this, remember, this is, this is a brief moment when Tammany did not control. So the pattern before had just been friends of cronies and whatnot. But he, he hired college graduates to make sure that, um, to put in what would today be sort of the assistant chief level. They're not on the street, but they're helping to design systems that are more efficient and that use resources more effectively. Um, in other words, it's, it's a job that needs the best minds that we can find. Um, and so he recruited in, uh, from, from local universities. Um, he also hired people who demonstrated they could do the job. And he didn't care what color they were. So he hired 25 African-American street sweepers. They weren't the first, but they, he definitely uh, bumped up the numbers quite a bit with just that one hire. And he appointed the first two African-American supervisors. Um, he did have this thing about the Italians being, you know, <laughs> especially well suited to the job. but. Um, I don't believe the civil service reforms came in until a couple of decades later. And I'm, I think Robert Moses had something to do with that, but I'm, this is another, I, I'm, I may be misspeaking. So others who want to ask questions, um, you can start forming a line by the pole in the center of the room. That's super interesting. Thank you. And I guess the question you asked about what district this was and also the uniforms made me kind of think that I actually don't know the kind of jurisdictions and if you could kind of provide some sort of cartographic snapshot of it because I think in my life here I've seen like in Crown Heights you have there's Orthodox who have their sanitation. I mean in Dumbo there's another. I mean so I, I feel like is it public private? I'm just sort of curious about that. And then my Second question was just about you as an anthropologist in residence. I was kind of curious a little bit about your ethnographic research there and, and what that looked like and who you interviewed and all of that. But yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious about how sanitation is mapped in the city because I don't really know and I'd like to. Thanks. Um, sanitation is mapped in the city in the following ways. Every community district boundary is the same as the sanitation district boundary. They are as sanitation would say, co-terminus. 
So I, I can show you a map of the community boards of the city. And in fact, in the front of my book, there's a map of the districts. Um, and there are probably people here who could actually tell you, if you give them an address, they could probably tell you what district that is. Uh, but that's, this is a, actually a, a really important um, uh, piece of the picture to understand. Sanitation only collects household waste uh, and from some nonprofits. But their primary responsibility is the waste that we generate every day in our homes. Private waste, in other words, that from restaurants and stores and, and offices and whatnot, that's the responsibility of a private carter. That business must have a contract with a private carter. There are approximately 200, I've seen the number 200, 250 different private carting companies that service New York City and the bids are competitive. So if I have a bookshop and Joe's Carding gives me 10 bucks a ton, but then um, there's a deli next door and, and Sam's Carding gives them $9 a ton, they might go with Sam and I might switch. Um, the, the result of that is often on a street, they collect at night, most of the private carters. You will have, if you have 10 businesses on a street, you might have 10 trucks on a street because you'll, you might have 10 different companies servicing those 10 different businesses. This is an interesting challenge and is one that the current sanitation administration is thinking about how to um, grapple with because it's certainly not the most efficient way to, to pick up the trash. Um, if you see, if it's a white truck, it's municipal. If it's not a white truck, it's, it's I'm, I'm going to say it's not municipal, but there are some vehicles in sanitation that are not white. But um, there's a law, if you buy a sanitation truck at auction after it's been um, decommissioned, if you will, you, can't, you have to paint it. You can't leave it white. Uh, that's a city truck. I, I want to think it's a leftover legacy from the uniforms. I don't, I don't think that's true. <laughs> Because there was an era when the uniforms and the trucks were not white, but now they're now they're white. And the uniforms are spruce is the color of the of the basic uniform, and I don't know what you call those vests that the, they are now mandated to wear. I would call them screaming yellow. But um, and then the the ethnographic question: I have burned to work with the Department of Sanitation in the City of New York since forever. Excuse me, and. Um, it's, it's what I call the once upon a time story when I was 10 and I'm in the f camping with my dad and it's beautiful, bucolic, utopian forest up in the Adirondacks except campers before us had left behind the, a dump, an open air dump. And I was young enough to, n to be absolutely outraged by this. And it planted the question, who picks up after us? However you define the us and wherever you are. So when I moved to New York as a young adult, I'm looking around at these big white trucks and I'm like, oh, they pick up after me and us. It wasn't for many years, it, it took many years for me to understand that I could actually hang out with them and, and do ethnography with them and, and ask, the basic question behind the book is, what is it to be a sanitation worker in New York City? And why should anybody care to know that? Why does that matter to know that? Um, I do believe, and I've argued in many places and will probably argue for the rest of my life, it's the most important job on the street because of all the reasons that we've discussed tonight, if that garbage doesn't flow, if it doesn't move, it will kill us. Maybe not immediately, but it will definitely cut us down. Um, and because they do it well, more or less, I'm not saying it's perfect, um, we, get to, we get to forget that they're there. So they're almost sort of a victim of their own success. Um, but when I, it took two years for the Department of Sanitation to agree to let me read through their archival material. And then it took another six months for them to agree to let me go talk to one sanitation worker at a garage. And then things slowly opened up from there. And then the test came up. And, I, and by, by then, I'd been doing research maybe for two years. This is a very long, slow project. And the, so the test came up. By the way, if anyone is curious to actually have not just the most important job on the street, but one of the best jobs on ever, the filing period for the next sanitation worker exam is right now. It's between October 1st and October 31st. So if you or anyone you know would like to try their hand at being a sanitation worker, this is the moment. This only comes up every few years, so um, grab it. Um, it's the best job partly because the camaraderie, when it's, when it's there, it's intense. 
No one knows the job except someone who shares the job with you. So the depth of friendship, I, I am deeply envious of the kinds of friendship that sanitation people have that my university colleagues and I, my university colleagues are perfectly wonderful people, but when I retire, I'm probably not going to be hanging out with them. Sanitation people, when they retire, they're still hanging out with each other unto the ends of their lives. And they're, they're, it's, it, they have golf outings. I don't golf. I should golf. They have golf <laughs> outings that sound like just a kick. And um, yeah, I mean, that's just one thing. They, the, I, some of the tightest friendships I've ever been privileged enough to see, right, to observe and to, to come to know the people in that relationship are people on the job. Now, I don't want to paint a picture of a bunch of saints in green uniforms. It's not perfect, of course. Um, I was very privileged to be able to be on the job, even just briefly. It was just a few months, but it was in the winter, so I did get to plow snow. I blocked the main entrance to the Bronx Zoo without realizing that's where I was. <laughs> and when the woman came out, like, nah, I mean, I completely blocked it. Uh, by then I was so lost, I climbed out of the truck and I thought, well, she's a girl, she'll understand, and I burst into tears. So now this woman has a truck blocking her entrance, she's got a crazy sanitation worker on her hands, and she can't solve my problem, which is I'm not supposed to back up without a guide person, but I have to back up to get out. And then when I finally do manage to get the truck out of that particular position, I left, I shouldn't ad admit this, they'll come after me for repairs, I left this trench of the tire mark in the grass next to the entrance because my backup swing was so wide and, and because it was winter and the ground was wet, it was very soft. And it, Anyway, uh, I don't tell that story in the book, by the way. Oh, it was not my best day. Yeah, Parks Department, that's right. I did, I did when, I first, when I first came on the job, a uh, mechanic said to me, oh, yeah, you're going to be on the job, okay. Well, you know what happens if you wreck a truck? And I said, no, oh, what happens when you wreck a truck? And he said, they give you another truck. <laughs> If you're, if you're on probation, you're pro it's, you don't want to do it while you're on probation. Anyway. Um, the woman in the last row on this side, and then gentleman at the pole. And again, if anyone else has a question, you can join the line at the center of the pole. Thank you. You're welcome. This is quick. I thank you that you partially answered my question about the private hauling. I live in West Chelsea. I lived there way before the High Line and before all of the activities there. So now with the additional restaurants and food service and tourists and la la la, you would think that with more trash, there would be more waste receptacles. But my, what I have found is that not only are there more, but they are taking away the waste receptacles on the corners of West Chelsea. So I always wonder, is that for security? Is it a monetary function? It's baffling to me. Um, the, the metric about litter baskets is a perpetual, um, what's it called when you're trying to figure out a mystery? Um, uh, I live in Queen and Long City and we've had that issue there too. And we were told that they started to remove our uh, waste baskets because they were being used for dumping. It, it's, come in and just dump yeah, and it's. Dump The, the, where, you, where you put them and how many you put and how often they're serviced and, and how do you handle the problem of someone dumping in a litter basket or putting household waste in a litter basket when you leave your house with a bag of trash and because you just, for whatever reason, you want to put it in the corner basket, illegal, plus rude, just to say. Um, but, but the placement of them, here's a strange metric. The fewer litter baskets you have, in many instances, the less litter you have. It seems quite counterintuitive, but for example, there was an exit on Staten Island where for some reason there was a litter basket in that sort of, uh, not, not on the street, but right next to where the highway exit curved. And of course people would try and, th they, would, they would think that they're like Michael Jordan and they would try to throw their litter. And so there were lots of complaints, so the department put three baskets. And then they had three times the litter. So then they took the baskets away and then there was not a litter problem. Or at least it was far, far smaller. I would suggest, if you want, to talk to the uh, head of the community board 
for where you live. I'm sure this is a problem they're already wrestling with. The changes that the High Line has brought to that neighborhood are still being, um, it hasn't settled yet into whatever it is becoming because of the High Line. Um, but the, the issue of baskets, the, I, I'm not going to call out the sanitation people who are in the room, but if anyone would like to help me with this particular question, I would be grateful for the assist. Oh, interesting. Your local government at work for you. Oh, hold on. Um, so I um, I'm aware that New York City spends hundreds of millions of dollars annually to um, transport our trash elsewhere. I'm curious if um, we've made any progress that's being reduced or perhaps you could point to um, best practices of other cities that are perhaps doing a better job than we are. Um, the issue of waste diversion. Diversion is the technical term meaning the stuff is diverted from the waste stream and goes into a recycling uh, system. Um, we are often, the, the number I hear most often about how much waste we divert is that we do 15%, one five of our household waste. Um, the city to which we are most often compared as an example of, holy, why can't we do it like they do it, is Seattle, uh, San Francisco, which claims to divert between 75 and 80 percent of their waste. Here are some of the differences. San Francisco is serviced by a private company. The entire city, all the private businesses and all the municipal garbage is under the jurisdiction of one company. It's called Recology. It used to be called NorCal. Uh, long before that, it was called Sunset Scavenging. It's actually a fascinating story. It's one of the country's oldest, largest, most successful worker-owned cooperatives. Uh, it was started by Italian immigrants in the early part of the 20th century, and they only filled job vacancies by bringing people over from this one region of northern Italy for, for quite a long time. But Recology, so Recology has a contract for all the waste in uh, San Francisco. So when they say 80%, they're including what are three distinct categories, municipal waste, commercial waste, and something called C&D, which is construction and demolition debris. So when a building is torn down, what's left? That has its own set of regulatory requirements and dumping laws and whatnot. We, when we say 15%, we're only talking about municipal waste, right? We don't keep the same kind of tabs on private waste or C&D because the reporting requirements are not the same as what the city asks of its own department. Um, we have now uh, uh, plastics, all plastics are um, not, not plastic bags, but all hard plastics are now recyclable in New York as of I think the summer of 2012. That was a big step forward because you remember looking at the bottom of bottles to figure out what the heck number was inside the microscopic little chasing arrows symbol, okay? All of it now can go. Um, and we've done paper and metal and glass for a while. We have recently rolled out organics. There are some pilot programs in different neighborhoods in the city where food waste is being composted. This could be quite promising. One of the challenges is going to be building the infrastructure underneath that so that it goes to the facility that can handle it and that we eventually get the tonnages that make it not sort of ghastly expensive and that we are not running four trucks down a street. 
now if you have, you have garbage collection, you have paper, metal and glass, and then you have, no I'm sorry, separate, you have garbage, then you have plastics, metal and glass in truck number two, then you have paper in truck number three, and now you have organics in truck number four. So in terms of the environmental plus, it's not yet clear that we are doing um, a service to the environment. With, but you have to start somewhere. And the challenge in New York, oh, that's the other really big difference with San Francisco. We are one of the most densely populated cities in the world. San Francisco is not. How do we, how do we put in place systems to monitor and manage waste from a, a thousand unit apartment building, for example? Um, we don't have the answer to that yet. Some people propose a system called pay as you throw and to meter the garbage the way you meter water, but that doesn't quite fit because we can get an individual water bill, whereas if my neighbor is a slob but I'm really careful and I only throw out a little bit of waste but he throws out truckfuls, I'm being charged for him being a slob. So that doesn't necessarily work. Where it works well, you pay for garbage collection, but recycling is free. So there's an incentive. And it's either done by volume or weight, different, different measures in different cities. Toronto, Toronto had a system that I loved. I don't know if it's still in place. It's mandatory. Household recycling is mandatory. If you don't comply and you get, uh, I think, two or three summonses, tickets from the city, they take you off collection completely. They won't even <laughs> pick up your garbage. They won't pick up anything. You are, you are now up a creek, so to speak. Um, and then you have to demonstrate compliance for three months before they'll put you back online. That's a pretty effective enforcement hammer to drop on somebody. I don't think we will do that anytime soon. But it was a nice story to hear, you know. I'm not sure I completely answered your question. There's a book I would recommend to you that is, I think, one of the most important environmental books written in the last 50 years. It's by uh, a woman named Samantha McBride, and it's called Recycling Reconsidered. She looks at how we came to understand recycling as the responsibility of an individual person and municipality, rather than going upstream and looking at the source of, you know, this kind of thing, and, and really pressing hard questions about where the responsibility might be placed so that it's not on us. That's not to say we should abdicate that responsibility. I think it's a really important one. But curbside recycling is this, well, let me give you the depressing statistic. And I, I, I don't mean to bring you down, but I think it's important that you know this. Municipal solid waste in the United States accounts for 3% of the waste stream. Even if we all recycle perfectly, there are huge quantities of other forms of waste that we are not paying attention to it, the way we pay attention to curbside programs, right? So curbside, to me, is a fantastic beginning. And in fact, apparently I was very deliberately not invited to speak to a solid waste um, uh, trade group because there's a paragraph in my book where I say curbside recycling doesn't do squat for global environmental health, right? I firmly, I'm an ardent recycler. I don't even like to misplace the cap off the milk, you know, the, the, or the, I mean, I want to make sure every single piece goes where it's supposed to go to be recycled. At the same time, it cannot be, we can't, we can't look at our curbside programs and get all chuffed up and say, gosh, we did a great job, and stop. We should get all chuffed up with pride and go, gosh, we did a great job, and now we have to, we have to sort of step toward a brighter, a broader horizon, right? Um, so that's, that's the second part of the answer to your question. But by all means, read Samantha's book. Um, I find I have to read it in pieces because it's extremely dense. She did years of meticulous, um, very detailed research. But she tells the story, and it's, um, it's a story that should be very widely known. My continuing, can you get, oh, here, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. My continuing question is on the anthropological side, which is, uh, do you know, have you been studying, the uh, points of view uh, from the sanitation workers' point of view of who we New Yorkers are? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to hear about that. Here's something you may not like to know. <laughs> your sanitation worker, if your sanitation worker has worked your block for any length of time, 
he or she knows you really well. Not because they snoop. They don't care about you that much. They do. They want to service you well, but they don't want to like spend time like, oh, look, they got back together. I thought that that split wouldn't last long. Or, uh-huh, look, he's drinking again. We knew that would happen. But it's not that finely grained. However, if you ask sanitation workers to give you a kind of a snapshot of the fortunes of a particular neighborhood where they've worked for a while, you will get a very savvy portrait of the economic kind of um, um, what's it called when something goes back and forth a lot? That. The economic back and forth a lot. Um, and uh, swings, sways, fluctuations, fluctuations. And spe sometimes specific stories. Look, when you see someone, when you see, when you see a photograph in the trash with a face hacked out of it, eh, there's probably a story behind that that, you know, somebody got mad. Or sud suddenly there are, there are diapers. Or there are, I mean, we, we, Think if this is something that we just never consider. What we leave behind tells the story of us as individuals and also as a culture. That's why Fresh Kills, once the largest landfill in the history of, of the well. Supposedly, it's one of the two uh, structures, one of only two structures built by humans naked. No, I'm mangling this. Fresh Kills and the Great Wall of China are the only two human-built structures on the planet that are visible to the naked eye from space. I have had this confirmed by a NASA somebody. But here's the thing, I still don't believe it because frankly, what does naked eye mean? Can I not wear my glasses? How close am I, space? Am I like at the stratosphere? Am I like how, many, how far out? I mean, there's too many questions for me to believe that. Also, isn't the interstate highway system just as big as the Great Wall bigger? How come we can't see that? Anyway, so Fresh Kills, Fresh Kills is, if nothing else, a vast archeological trove to be discovered sometime in the future. We are now sending our garbage very far away. There's nowhere inside the boundary of the city where we can dispose of our own waste, any of our own waste. Um, so think of the archeologists of the future who are gonna be really confused when they're digging up New York City waste in Virginia and Alabama and Ohio and Pennsylvania. Like, wow, this is an amazing trading network that they, it's in all their garbage here, I don't know. But, but it's, our, it's our story. And um, to me, Fresh Kills is like a vast uncatalogued museum uh, 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 of archaeological wonder. And somebody will dig it up someday, and then they'll know us by what we, what we cast off. Okay, final question, sir. The honor is yours. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one, one of the audience brought out a point which I thought was interesting, and that's the difference between private and public sanitation. Just as a side, you mentioned uh, San Francisco being all private, but being one company, it's quasi-private. It's, it's yes. monopolistic, yes. so it's not really private with well, this competition. And, and it's a worker-owned cooperative. Sector. Okay. But in, in a city like this, um, is, is, there not, is there still public sanitation because of union strength, preventing probably much more efficient private collection from, from being the norm? That's my question. Um, the union is strong. Sanitation Worker Union, uh, it's local 831 of the Teamsters, and um, the president of the union is also the president of the Municipal Labor Council, which is a um, organization of all public workers in the entire city. It's 300,000 some odd people. He's co-president of that. Um, the union is strong. The, the history of private, I researched this in detail for my book because I was very curious about exactly that question. The history of public versus private sanitation service. Since the Dutch, it's gone back and forth. It was private. Then that stopped working very well and so then it was made public. And then that stopped working and then it was made private. Um, the current situation came about in part because the privates, I, I don't want to cast an entire workforce as corrupt. That would, that's not what I'm implying. The, the, and I'm not implying that the sanitation department is not corrupt. In, no, that's not what I meant. Boy, that was a bad thing to say. What I mean is, again, you don't have a whole workforce of saints, right? Sometimes people in sanitation try to get away with stuff that they shouldn't, just like in the privates sometimes. But the private-public split 
makes it much less likely that there will be corruption shot through garbage collection practices, in part because the, the punitive consequence of cheating in sanitation is, is severe. If you take a $5 bribe to take an extra load of trash because a householder has done renovations and they happen to have more than is supposed to go into a truck in a single collection round, and you take a $5 bill and the IG finds out or the press, or you've just lost your job. Maybe you're 19, 19 years toward your 20-year pension, or now it's a 22-year pension. You just lost your job. You just lost your benefits. You just lost your career. So the enforcement power of the city inside a public domain is far more effective than what has been possible on the private side. Um, does that help the consumer? Does it help the consumer? Well, I'd rather give five dollars and have my rubbish taken away by a private contractor. But then, therefore, what if what if you? It it. So I'm not sure. Rubbish, that's the whole, that's the uh, hold on, he has your answer. <laughs> <laughs> if you give it to privates, what's going to stop them from raising your rents, your your prices, and who's going to pay in what building, and which which tenant? pays for their own, or it's the landlords that pay well, in the like, large buildings. It's a building. It's like hot water. It's like insurance. It's, it's and what stops them from raising or fighting <laughs> against it? But it's still it's your maintenance. What, what stops somebody from having a heat on an open well, I guess you can do it with the police department and the fire department also. That's a good point as well. This is a... This is a this is a thick debate, as you can see, and one that gets uh, heated pretty quickly. Um, I think I'm going to conclude the evening without stepping further into it, just because it does get very tangled very fast. Um, I'm grateful for your questions and your insights and your presence. Thank you for being here. Robin, thank you for coming. Uh, just to let all of you know, we have several copies of Picking Up, uh, and I'm sure Robin would be happy to sign them for you. We're selling them at 15% off tonight, so it's a, a good time to come, and um, it's really a collective staff favorite here at the museum. I hope you all come back for one of our future Tenement Talks programs. Next week, we're going to have a program with an organization called the League of Kitchens, and they are actually... Um, they provide cooking workshops that are taught by home cooks, immigrant women who are, who are trained home cooks. So they invite people into their home, and it's kind of like a culture exchange. So we're going to have the founder and some home cooks, and Molly O'Neill, who's a former food columnist with the New York Times, is going to come and moderate that discussion. The following Wednesday, we're going to have a talk about Meyer London, um, who may be a little-known historical figure here, but he was actually the second socialist uh, elected to Congress, and he came from this neighborhood. So 1914 was, his <laughs> was, uh, was the year that he was finally uh, elected to Congress, and we're going to have a program uh, with his biographer, his grandniece, um, a couple of historians. Rabbi um, Andy Kaufman is uh, going to be here, and we'll have an actor who's going to kind of bring Meyer London's words to life. So I hope you all come back on a Wednesday night at 6.30 and, and join us at the museum. On yeah, line. we do, and we also have flyers uh, in the back. Do members, get, do members get discounts at the gift store? Yes. So here's, a, here's another plug. <laughs> if you join the museum, I mean, for heaven's sakes, buy my book, obviously, but, but even if you don't buy my book, join the museum, and then you have a discount at the coolest museum gift shop, certainly in this neighborhood, I would even say in the city, and you support the, the cause of um, this extraordinary institution. So I just want to make a plug, not just for, I, I want to, like, come every week. Come every week. But become a member. That's even bigger. Please. That's, there you go. Thank you.